Welcome to BC Talks. I'm Brandon Cody, and today we're going to be talking about The Mandalorian Season 3. Uh, we're going to go over the last episode of the season, which came out uh, this morning, because they come out at 3 a.m. for some reason on the East Coast. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I know why, because, uh, you know, different time zones, different times. But uh, it is kind of uh, a struggle when you live on the East Coast to watch these Mandalorian episodes or any of the Disney episodes, really. They all release at 3 a.m. on the Eastern time zone. But uh, we're going to talk about the last episode that came out uh, today, and then we're going to go over the season as a whole. <clears throat> and before we even get started, I want to let y'all know that there are going to be spoilers in this episode because I'm talking about the episode and uh, the season as a whole. So if you haven't watched the past episode, then... I don't know what you're, you're doing watching a recap or a review <laughs> of the episode. Uh, click off this and go watch it. But if you have, then uh, let's get down into it. So um, this episode was directed by Rick Famuyiwa, and it was written by John Favreau. And you can really tell, in my opinion, uh, this episode, compared to a lot of the other ones in the season, it's one of the better ones. It just feels a lot more, I don't know, cinematic, a lot more well-written um well directed rick famuyiwa in my opinion he's directed some of the better episodes of the mandalorian alongside bryce dallas howard uh him and bryce dallas howard have directed some of the better episodes and obviously dave filoni the ones he does obviously because he's the creator and his are always good but um the the episode uh rick famuyiwa's episodes really they always feel very cinematic uh they feel very well directed uh the pacing's always great um, the action is, you know, balanced well with the dialogue. And so I think, in my opinion, I think Rick Famuyiwa deserves, um, you know, to direct something longer than an episode. You know, maybe if it's a one, sh a longer one shot or I don't know, maybe a special presentation, kind of like how Disney's been doing with Marvel, how they did Werewolf by Night, something like that. I think Rick Famuyiwa uh, deserves a bigger role. Uh, than just the Mandalorian, and hopefully, hopefully we see him, you know, direct other episodes of things like Ahsoka. Uh, I'm sure they'll bring him over. Um, but uh, like I said before, uh, the episode it feels really uh, cinematic. Just some of the camera shots. There's a lot of the I call it the Top Gun shot. <laughs> I know Top Gun didn't Top Gun Maverick didn't come up with this shot, but you know that shot Top Gun Maverick where they got the camera on the side or the back, the side of the wing of a plane or the back. Um, of a plane, and it's kind of just going, it's kind of like that, that shot, uh, if you've seen this episode, you know, or any episode, um, a lot of them, a lot of shots like that were in this season, where they'd be on, like, the jet, the camera would be fixed on the jetpack of one of the Mandalorians, and then you see it from that perspective, things like that, and then some of the, um, some of the pull-ins, and just a lot of the shots are very cinematic in this episode, um, and Rick Femme, episodes in general, so uh, that was, uh, you know, that's always a good thing to see. Uh, and the CGI in uh, this episode, really in this whole season as a whole, has really stepped it up and really been great in my opinion. You know, the, the Star Destroyer looked awesome as it was coming down. You know, nothing really looked fake or unbelievable. Some of the in-air fight with the Mandalorians and, the uh, you know, the troopers with the Beskar armor, uh, those were kind of uh, iffy, but, you know, they're swinging things through the air it's kind of hard to get perspective you know and feel the actual um you know feel the actual weight of the fight when they're flying through the air <laughs> on their jetpacks but um regardless the uh the episode's really cinematic and i really enjoyed um enjoyed the episodes that were like that that kind of had those different played with the shots a little bit um and rick family you always is great at that now, uh, before we get in the episode, I, I wanted to address something that I talked about in uh, the latest episode of Watch and Play, actually the first episode of Watch and Play on the channel. If you haven't watched it, check it out. It'll be uh, there, I think. <laughs> and um, But uh, I talked about some of the rumors going around in the Star Wars community that the armorer might have been like a double agent or double crossing them, and I'm glad that she was not. <laughs> Because, um, you know, I think it was just fans um, overanalyzing different things. You know, although Disney did not help, or Lucasfilm, I guess, didn't help with the different um, crumbs they've been planting. Like, putting the armorer as the, as the um, thumbnail for the episode titled The Spies. <laughs> that doesn't help when you're, uh, when you're trying to say that she's not, you know, a bad actor. But, um... 
the I'm glad that she was not, you know, double crossing the Mandalorians because I really like her character. And if they just kind of made her evil or working for Moff Gideon, that would have um kind of uh, ruined her character, in my opinion. So I'm glad that she was not a spy or a double agent or double crossing the Mandalorians like a, like some of the Star Wars fans were speculating. <laughs> and another character that some of the Star Wars fans speculated about was Axe Wolves. Um, but it turned out that th that speculation was unfounded too. Axe Wolves is, um, uh, he's goaded in my eyes. <laughs> you know, he, he almost, he was going to go down with the ship. He escaped at the last minute, but, um, which I'm glad that they didn't kill him. Although if they had killed him, I would have been like, eh, at least he went out with a bang, literally. But, um, you know, it's always the, um, the jerks, the characters that are big jerks, kind of like Paz Vizsla, rest in peace. The, uh, those characters that are big jerks, they, um, are always the ones that end up coming through when, uh, things get real, when the going gets tough, they're the ones that end up coming through for you. So, uh, I kind of felt like Paz Vizsla, he was just kind of that, or not Paz Vizsla, well, Paz Vizsla too, but, you know, he, he, uh, perished in the last episode in the episode before this one but um not Paz Vizsla uh Axe Wolves I always felt like he was that kind of character to where he was uh you know he was just a jerk but he was down you know he was he was a writer he was down so um he certainly was in this episode so uh to get into the episode um it starts off with Axe Wolves you know in the last episode he was able to escape the ambush uh and get to the the Mandalorian's uh, Star Destroyer that they were, that they um, had. And he gets there, he tells them all to evacuate and get down to help Bo-Katan because they're getting jumped by the, by the troopers and Moff Gideon. So they all leave the Star Destroyer to go help Bo-Katan down on Mandalore. And uh, Axe Wolves, he stays behind because uh, there were some uh, Imperial uh, ships, Imperial uh, Starfighters that were going after... Um, that were going after the Star Destroyer because they said, well, all the Mandalorians are on the Star Destroyer. If we blow up the Star Destroyer, we can get rid of most of the Mandalorians. So uh, that's why he told them to leave because he was going to be a decoy for them and, uh, you know, take all the fire on the Star Destroyer. And so I thought there was a really, uh, you know, cool thing he did, a really noble thing he did to try to save his people. Uh, you know, Axe Wolves, uh, you know, love the guy. He's a jerk, but you got to love him. He's always going to be down for you. <laughs> And, um, we also got, uh, after that, we get, uh, we got a sweet, uh, that I was talking about earlier with the cinematic shocks. We got a nice, uh, air battle between the troopers and the Mandalorians, uh, you know, Bo-Katan swinging the dark saber through the air, uh, the armorer by her side, whacking people with her hammer, <laughs> which, uh, you know, <clears throat> the armorer, uh, she's a real, she's an OG because she's just using a hammer when everybody else got blasters, Bo-Katan's got the dark saber. <laughs> Um, and some people have, you know, the staffs and then she's just there with a hammer, just whacking people <laughs> out of the air. I always think it's funny when you see it and it does kind of look funny, like I said before. Uh, but, uh, you know, what is somebody flying through the air on a jetpack hitting people with a hammer going to look like, <laughs> I don't know how you could make it look much better, <laughs> but, um, while they're doing that, uh, Din and Grogu are at the base. They're looking for Moff Gideon. They're trying to take him out. Because Din says, if we don't take him out now, he's never going to stop. So we got to find him and take him out, uh, which, you know, makes sense. Uh, so uh, Din, he calls R5, which we get to see R5 again, the droid, his protocol droid. Uh, we get to see R5 uh, load some, he comes down to the base. And uh, Din gets him to load some schematics of the base onto his, um, on his wrist there so he can see, you know, get a feel for the base and see where Moff Gideon's uh, command center might be. So um, they get to this hallway where there's a bunch of shields set up and there's like two guards, two troopers uh, in every set, behind every set of shields. And um, they do this thing where he tells R5 to drop a shield. He fights two of them. Then he tells R5 to drop the shield. He fights two more of them. And if you've seen the episode, uh, it kind of reminded me of, I don't know if, uh, well, I was going to say, I don't know if you've played Call of Duty. Everybody's played Call of Duty. But um, if you've played the mode in Call of Duty called the Gun Game, the online multiplayer mode, where uh, it's a mode where you every time you kill somebody, you get a new weapon. And that's kind of what it felt like. This kind of felt like a episode, like the uh, level of a game <laughs> in this uh, this particular scene. Because uh, he started off, because you know, he, in the 
before he was captured, so they took all his stuff. So he didn't have a weapon. So he has to fight the two first two guards. He gets like their knife, and then uh, when the R two drop, when R two R five drops the, the first shield, he you know slices them up, throws them off the thing, uh, and then gets a blaster. Then they drop another shield. Then he gets a um, he gets like a shield and a new blaster, and so they keep doing that. And then uh, while that's happening, R five is getting jumped by some mouse droids who are sounding the alarm. So, um, you know, the last shield kind of gets dropped a little late because R5 has to shoo the mouse droids away. Um, it's always cool when you see mouse droids. <laughs> but um, so uh, the they get through the shield uh, part, and then Den and Grogu, they're looking for Moff Gideon, and they get to his uh, the cloning room, which is um, a room, you know, if you've seen any show with clones in them, um, you know, it's a room with a bunch of tanks with clones of Moff Gideon. And so we do finally get to see some of the Moff Gideon clones and some of what he's been working on. Cause you know, that's go all the way back in episode one. The reason why they took Grogu is because they were trying to, uh, isolate the, I guess his midichlorians so they could put them in the clones and make clones that had the force of themselves. Um, so that's the reason why they even, why Grogu was even in this in the first place. If you even remember back to season one, <laughs> But um, we get a little jump scare, too, from one of the clones. It kind of opens its eyes, but, and Grogu kind of gets scared before Din smashes all of the tanks um, and, I guess, kills all the clones. Uh, I don't think he actually killed all the clones. I think a, maybe one of them might have escaped, and we're going to see them a, a Moff Gideon again, and this time he's going to have the Force or some, you know, ability to use the Force. Or um, Moff Gideon might have clones somewhere else, uh, and uh, they're going to get activated in another season. But uh, either way, all the clones that are on the base on Mandalore get, um, you know, destroyed. And so they they finally get to Moff Gideon, and, uh, you know, he gives them a little monologue. He's mad that he destroyed the clones because he was going to have, uh, he was isolating the um, ability to use the Force. So he's, uh, I guess, have the midichlorians and the clones. I don't know how you do that, but... <laughs> I don't know what the Star Wars science is behind that, but <clears throat> the clones were going to be able to use the Force, and so he was going to make an army of clones of himself um, that have the Force, which kind of would be fire to see. <laughs> it would be, be even worse than the Clone, just the clone Wars uh, Part 2, <laughs> except they're all clones of Moff Gideon, and they're using the Force. That would be uh, hard to beat. <laughs> so, uh, But um, Moff Gideon, he kicks Din around a little bit, and then some of the Praetorian guards show up, those guys in the red, if you don't know who those are. Um, they show up, and they kind of jump Grogu while Din's getting uh, kicked around by Moff Gideon. And they get separated. And um, we uh, get a little scene of uh, they the Praetorian guard are slicing up Grogu's mech. <laughs> you know, IG-12, IG which it was Grogu was walking around in like a mech, uh, like a mecha in an anime. <laughs> but um, he gets he gets sliced up, so he has to hop out. He's jumping around, hopping around, kind of like um, it, it reminded me of uh, Yoda his fight against Palpatine in um, <clears throat> Revenge of the Sith. That's what a, that's um, that fight looks a little silly if you watch it nowadays. But honestly, it's one of my favorite fights up there. It's not my favorite. I would say it's <clears throat> top five maybe fights in star wars just because i don't know i like it's funny to watch and um you know duel of the fates playing while emperor palpatine's in there in the senate and he's throwing the senate i guess those are chairs or whatever floating chairs at him and they're ju he's hopping through them it just looks funny and it looks cool at the same time to me with duel of the fates playing in the background and so um that uh, this scene kind of reminded me of that from revenge of the sith um it was uh, kind of funny to see Grogu hopping around because, <laughs> you know, he's a little puppet um, and uh, he's just hopping around, dodging them. Um, and uh, so then um, Bo-Katan sees um, Din getting kicked around by Moff Gideon. So she goes down with the Darksaber um, to help him. And she says, go, go, you know, go get your kid. So Din goes to save Grogu from the Praetorian Guards and uh, Bo-Katan takes on Moff Gideon. Now, um, this fight was uh, pretty cool. Moff Gideon's got uh, like a some kind of staff. I forget what those staffs are called. They have a name, I'm pretty sure. But he's got the staff. They're fighting each other. And um, I don't know how that staff can stand up to the Darksaber because I thought that the Darksaber could, like, you know, slice Beskar and whatnot. So I'm not sure how he's blocking 
the dark saber but um he crushes the hilt the hilt of the dark saber and destroys it uh so no more dark saber <laughs> sorry about it uh they're gonna have to find a new way to get a new leader i guess whenever bogatan's done uh, maybe they'll have an election <laughs> but the dark saber gets destroyed and um the dark saber gets destroyed and while that's happening um ax wolves is up in space he's uh coming down in the star destroyer because you know it gets uh blown up and so uh it's coming down and um ax wolves tells them all to leave the base because he's gonna crash the star destroyer into the base to just you know destroy the um the imperial base that was on mandalore and so um and obviously like i said before ax wolves blasts one of the windows and gets out before the star destroyer crashes so um I'm, again, I'm glad that they didn't kill him and he escaped because he's a great character. I like to see him in the future. But um, so while that's happening, while the Star Destroyer is coming down, Din comes back after saving Grogu from the Praetorian Guard. And Din, Bo-Katan, and Grogu, you know, mom, dad, and the son, <laughs> they all team up on Moff Gideon. They're beating him up. Grogu's using the Force to toss all of Moff Gideon's weapons away and trip him and whatnot. And um, finally, the Star Destroyer comes down into the base and blows up and engulfs everything in fire. And so uh, Moff Gideon gets, you know, burned and seemingly I guess he's dead now because I don't know how you would survive that. Even with Beskar armor, uh, everything, the whole entire base blew up. And you think, oh, no, they're all going to die, um, Din, Grogu, and Bo-Katan. But then we get a cool shot of Grogu using the Force to uh, create a shield over Bo-Katan and Din. And so he shields them from the explosion in the fire. And so they survive and Moff Gideon and his base get destroyed. And uh, one thing that was funny that I uh, realized that I uh, recognized about this is that I saw, I actually saw some people talking about this too online. Um, if you've watched Breaking Bad, Giancarlo Esposito, who plays Moff Gideon, he plays the bad guy in uh, Breaking Bad, um, Gus Fring. And uh, Gus Fring in Breaking Bad, uh, spoiler if you haven't watched that as well, he dies. And uh, the way he gets killed is uh, he gets blown up. <laughs> and then he gets burned so bad that he um, that he dies uh, from, you know, he dies from the complications of getting blown up, obviously. So um, it's funny that Giancarlo Esposito's character in Breaking Bad gets blown up in and dies. And now Moff Gideon, his character in The Mandalorian, gets blown up and dies. <laughs> so I was thinking, if they don't blow up uh, Stan Edgar in The Boys, if you watch The Boys, you know, Giancarlo Esposito, he plays the bad guy. Well, one of them. I mean, who's really the bad guy in The Boys? I guess Homelander, but, you know, they're all kind of bad in their own way. <laughs> but um, Stan Edgar plays the boss of what in The Boys. And um, so I was thinking, if they don't blow up Stan Edgar... Or like have him die of some fiery, you know, explosion or death, then uh, I'm gonna be disappointed <laughs> because we gotta keep the trend going of him getting blown up, and his character's getting blown up and dying. Um, so I thought it was a little funny thing I I saw that um, you know, I thought was uh, interesting. <laughs> I want to see Stan Edgar get blown up somehow now in the boys, but um, back to Star Wars. <laughs> uh, the the uh, later on uh, in the episode. Uh, after all that happens, after Grogu saves them from the explosion, we see Paz Vizsla's son, uh, Ragnar, I think his name is. Uh, he's down in the waters of Mandalore. He's uh, reciting the creed to become, you know, a Mandalorian um, apprentice, I guess. And uh, Din asks the, uh, tells the armorer that he wants Grogu to become a, um, to recite the creed. But um, the armorer says he's too young to speak. And so since he can't speak, he can't recite the creed, so he can't become a Mandalorian. So then um, Din asks her, well, what if uh, his parents give him permission to become a Mandalorian apprentice? And uh, she says, well, you know, we don't know who his parents are, if they're even still alive. We don't know where they're at um, because obviously, you know, the Jedi, they died. And so his parents probably are not around. <laughs> and um, so then Din says, well, I'll just adopt him then. He's my son now. So we even though, you know, everybody calls him Din's son, uh, now he is actually Din's son, for real. He is. He gets named Din Grogu. Um, so then I guess, uh, so since he's uh, Din Grogu, I guess it's kind of like in Asian countries where their last name is first. Uh, so 
he's so I guess Din's name is actually we've all been calling him Din. I guess his name is actually Jaren. <laughs> and Din is kind of his title because they call him Din Grogu. Uh so I guess Jaren is Din's actual first name. We've been all calling him Din, but Din just is easier to say than Jaren. So I'm gonna keep calling him Din. <laughs> but uh so now we got Din Grogu, who is officially a Mandalorian apprentice. And uh, the armor tells him, well, now you got to take him off on, uh, his, you know, his uh, Mandalorian adventures. You got to teach him the ways of the Mandalore. Um, so they leave, they go off, and then we get a cool shot of Bo-Katan uh, in front of all of the Mandalorians now united. Uh, some of them with the helmets on, some of them with the helmets off. They're all together. She lights the forge, uh, the you know, the great forge of Mandalore, and uh, reignites and then Axe Wolves, you know, he says, for Mandalore, and they're all chanting, for Mandalore, and so that was pretty uh, dope to see all the, um, you know, what the armor said, how she could, the armor said that Bo-Katan could unite all of the Mandalorians, and we finally get to see them all united, which is a crazy thing to see. I don't think anybody ever thought we'd see all the Mandalorians united on Mandalore. That's kind of a real nerdy thing, <laughs> but it's cool to see in live action, uh, just to see all the Mandalorians, you know, united again on Mandalore. Um, after defeating, you know, Moth Gideon. And um the um so now after after that uh scene, then then he goes to that little um that little cantina where Captain Tava's always ha hanging out. I don't know where that is, but Captain Tava's always hanging out there. You can always find him. If you need to find Captain Tava, go to that cantina. <laughs> and uh so Din meets up at Captain Tava and um they he offers to help him round up some of the you know Imperial uh, the former Imperial officers that are hanging out in the outer rim because the new Republic, you know, we saw before Captain Table was trying to get the new Republic to authorize him to go after or to help the Mandalorians because they were getting attacked and they said, you know, they couldn't do that. So, um, you know, Din knows about all the red tape and bureaucracy and new Republic. So Captain Table says the new Republic, they're never going to allow this. And um, Din says, well, you know, do it off the record. Don't tell anybody. So, uh, you know, I think, so I guess Captain Tava is going to have a bigger role going forward, which is cool. I like Captain Tava. His actor was in uh, Kim's Convenience alongside Simu Liu, if you haven't uh, watched that show, the Canadian show. Um, that's where Simu Liu got his start before he became Shang-Chi. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I like that character a lot, and he's going to have a bigger role moving forward, looks like, working with Din in the Outer Rim, getting rid of Imperial, uh, former Imperial officers. They need to go find, um, what's her name, who was played by Katie O'Brien. I can never remember her actual name. The one that's the actual spy that was working for Moff Gideon. They need to find her. And because, uh, you know, I guess she's going to be the big, well, not the big boss. They still have that, the Shadow Council. But I wonder if she's going to get elevated to the Shadow Council now since Moff Gideon's dead. That'd be interesting to see. Um... Or if she even knows about the Shadow Council. I don't know. We'll see going forward. <laughs> but um, I'm just glad that we're going to get to see Din and Grogu, or I guess Jaren and Grogu, go on, you know, bounty hunting adventures again. Because that's what was so great about the, you know, the first season of The Mandalorian. Uh, other than, you know, Grogu, obviously, Baby Yoda, the Baby Yoda craze of the first season. One of the great things about the first season was Grogu and Din just going on adventures throughout space you know, uh, being bounty hunters. So I'm glad that they're going to get back into that for the next season. Cause that's something that this season was sorely lacking in my opinion. Um, some swashbuckling. <laughs> and, um, so after this scene with Captain Tabo where they, you know, do the little deal where Din's going to be a bounty hunter for the new Republic under the table. Uh, then he meets up with grief Karga. Um, and, uh, he grief Karga offers Din a little shack outside the city and um, in um, Din, he brings back IG-11, um, and he found the parts, which I forgot to mention, there was a head of a of a, one of the um, assassin droids where Captain Table was. They had a bunch of trophies up at the top, and one of them was a head of an assassin droid. So Din take, took that and used the parts to fix IG-11, and uh, so now IG-11's back, and he's going to be the marshal um, that Grief Cargo was asking Din to be, because, you know, they needed a marshal. Um, and Navarro, and um, then he couldn't be that because he couldn't stay there. But um, he's gonna have IG 11 be the marshal now, so that's cool. We get to see IG 11 back. Um, 
Taika Waititi's back, which uh, you may or may not enjoy that. But um, uh, either way, IG-11 is back. He's the Marshal of Navarro now. And uh, the episode ends with uh, Din. Uh, he's hanging out at his new shack, just chilling, watching Grogu play in a pond, uh, using the force to toss around a little frog. And you think, oh, no, he's going to chomp on that little frog because <laughs> that's what Grogu loves doing, chomping on frogs, um, scarving them down. <laughs> But um, he drops it into the water, so uh, that was a funny little way to end the episode because <laughs> you think he's gonna eat, he's gonna swallow it like he does in every other episode, uh, but then he drops it. <laughs> so um, that's a funny way to end the episode. Um, so overall, the season overall, I'd say it was an okay season. Uh, the last couple episodes have been great, um, but uh, overall, you know that the season hasn't been anything groundbreaking or um, you know mind blowing. Uh, there was definitely room for improvement, in my opinion. But uh, as a as a season, I I enjoyed it. I can see why some people. There's definitely problems with the season, um, but um, I enjoyed it. I can see why some a lot of people, you know, have been meh about the season though. Um, the um, I'm sad that Paz Vizsla he's gone because uh, you know as a big guy myself, I always root for the big tanky characters. <laughs> And uh, Paz Vizsla, you know, he was the he was the tank of the team. So sad to see him go, but he went out, you know, um, in a great way. So uh, protecting Mandalore, and he'd be proud of what Bo-Katan and Din were able to do, reuniting Mandalore and getting rid of Moff Gideon and the Imperials. So, um, and also I think his son, Ragnar, is going to have a bigger role moving forward because they keep on focusing on him. They've shown him a little bit in this episode, more than a lot of the other Mandalorians. They um, focus on, they tend to, you know, dwell on Ragnar a little bit um, in different parts of different episodes. So I think that his son Ragnar, he might get a little bit older moving forward and uh, he might have a bigger role um, in the coming seasons, I think. That's just my opinion. I think he will. Um, he recited the creed in this episode and I guess became an official, official Mandalorian since he didn't get to do that because he got captured earlier in the season while he was trying to recite the creed. But, um... Hopefully, you know, Paz Vizsla will get to live on through his son, Ragnar. Um, another thing about the season, I'm glad Bo-Katan, you know, finally got to embrace her destiny as the leader of Mandalore. The Darksaber's gone, so um, that's sad to see. But uh, maybe they can get the, the Kyber Crystal and fix it. <clears throat> maybe they, although it did blow up, I don't know if anybody thought to save the crystal. <laughs> but, um, you know, Bo-Katan, she's now the leader of Mandalore. And uh, she reunited Mandalore. And something that didn't happen is uh, that, um, you know, all the Bo-Katan or the uh, Bo-Din shippers are going to be sad because um, Bo-Katan and Din didn't get together. <laughs> but honestly, you know, everybody doesn't need to get together on every single show. Come on. So, um, I mean, they did. Bo-Katan and Din did have great chemistry together. I'll say that. But, uh, you know, she's got to lead Mandalore, and he's got to go take Grogu off on his adventures. I'm sure we'll see Bo-Katan again in the future. She'll definitely come back to help them out, and maybe we'll see something in the future. <laughs> but um, another thing I noticed is that the Persials never showed up again. Um, <clears throat> the Persials, if you don't know who, what those are, they're those giant space whales that were floating with Din and Grogu alongside of them when they were in hyperspace in that one episode. They, they're the, you know, the giant force sensitive space whales that's the best way i can describe it they're they were from the rebels series um and they showed up in this for a little bit it was i guess it was just a little cameo they didn't really have a big part to play some people were thinking they might you know come back or have some bigger part to play maybe they'll uh do something more in um in ahsoka since that there's a lot of rebels characters coming back you know like uh sabine and hera and obviously grand admiral thrawn so um since uh, they're all coming back, maybe the Purgils will come back too because they were in Rebels. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I guess we'll see about that. But the Purgils never came back. Uh, we did get to see the Mythosaur again. at the I forgot to mention that at the end of the episode, well, towards the end of the episode, when um, when uh, Grogu, you know, gets the blessing from the armor to become Din Grogu, um, Grogu looks down into the waters of Mandalore, and I guess you can tell he's... Because, you know, Grogu is obviously Force-sensitive. He's sensing the the Mythosaur. And we get the little shot going down through the water, deep into the waters of Mandalore. And you see the Mythosaur open its eye. <laughs> so, um, 
we did get to see the mythosaur again but um so i'll be excited to see where that whole thread goes because the armorer knows that boca can solve the mythosaur so i wonder if there's going to be anything about that um in the future um but uh overall again you know i'm excited to see where season four goes now that din's back uh, venturing with grogu as a bounty hunter that was really the core of the mandalorian was uh din and grogu going around different places being bounty hunters fighting bad guys so uh and now that grogu seems to be more comfortable using the force uh we'll get to see him you know have a bigger role in some of the fights which is going to be pretty cool to see um and uh, i also don't think this is the last we've seen of moff gideon like i said before there's he one of the clones had to have escaped and if they didn't, uh, he probably has got a clone, clones somewhere else. I doubt that was the only place he was working on clones or moved his clones. So I think we're going to see Moff Gideon again, uh, but in clone form. And this time he's going to have the force. So that's going to be interesting to see. Because uh, he did mention that that's what he was trying to do. Uh, harness the power of the force into clones. So he can make an army. So I think they're going to pop up somewhere in the future. Um, if not in the Mandalorian, then maybe in another series like Ahsoka. Or a different series. But I definitely think... Moth Gideon is not finished. The fiery blaze that uh, engulfed Moth Gideon <laughs> was not his end. <laughs> but uh, again, uh, like I said, the season was okay. I think if I had to give it a grade, I would give it, um, you know, a B. Uh, the it was it was good. I enjoyed it. There was definitely some downs, uh, but there were a lot of highs, a lot of ups to the season uh, overall. And now that again, like I said before, now that Din and Grogu are back you know, going on their adventures through space. Uh, I'm glad to see that. And uh, we're going to get a lot of cool episodes now that uh, we got Din Grogu and Din Jarring, the Mandalorians going out together. And uh, so I guess like uh, the Mandalorian here was uh, Grogu. Well, it was Grogu. It was Bo-Katan. It was Din, everybody, and the Mandalore as a whole. Um, so a lot of people, that's the one thing a lot of people said they focused on uh, Din less, but really it was about, the band they should have named it the mandalorians because this whole season was about the mandalorians um but uh like i said i'd give the season a b let me know what y'all thought about the season down in the comments below what you think about this episode i thought it was a great episode a great way to end the season but let me know what you thought about it down in the comments below uh let me know what you thought about the whole season as a whole and uh, what you think about uh, some of the theories you got for the future. Uh, one of mine, obviously, is Moff Gideon's not dead. He's coming back. But let me know what your theories are for the future down in the comments below. Make sure you like the video and subscribe for more Star Wars talk. If you want some more Star Wars talk, I got a video about Star Wars Celebration that'll be popping up. You can click on that and watch it. And uh, I will see y'all another day.